here is what Ms. Heard looked like on the James Corden show the next day. Well, the reason why this was important to me is this was the first time that your number three moved. And he did a full lean in to the screens. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. And last week I had a very special guest on the channel. His name is Rob Morton. He's from the YouTube channel Law and & Lumber. And he was actually in the courtroom during Amber Heard's cross-examination. And we talked to him and he gave us a whole bunch of insight about what the jury was doing and the atmosphere in the room. And you had some amazing comments. So I begged him to go back to the courtroom. And he went back not just on any day, but he went back on the day that we had the closing arguments and he had some amazing insight on what the jury was doing and a lot of the body language that we could not see on camera from other players that the camera wasn't focusing on. So we had a whole conversation about that event and we split that conversation in half. Half of that video is gonna be here on this channel and the other half is going to be on his. So if you guys check this out, if you guys love the insight, you could head over to his and check the rest of it out. And there is some amazing insight as to what was going on during closing arguments in the courtroom. Rob, super excited to have you back on the channel. Now, before we jump into these clips, there's a couple of questions I'm getting a lot in the comments, and I wanna get these out of the way before we break down the clips and you give us all the insight that you spotted that I'm so excited about. So the first question I'm getting a lot is, why is there a jury of nine if two of them are going to be dismissed? So which is, what's interesting about this one is it's not really a jury of nine. There were 11 jurors that were impaneled and there are four alternates because Virginia with this uh, level of claim, with this amount of damages, the jury has to be seven people and that jury has to be unanimous when they reach a decision. They impanel 11 jurors and they filter out four of them at the end and actually send seven back into the room to deliberate. Um, so what the judge does, the judge puts all the names in an envelope, pulls out four random ones, and then puts it in a separate envelope. And this is kind of interesting in this case. Uh, separate envelope, seals it, and then at the very end of the trial, opens the envelope and pulls out the names of the alternates and says, you guys are dismissed. Well, there were two jurors that were dismissed early on in the case because of medical reasons and personal reasons. So that's why two were dismissed uh, before they went to deliberation. So basically there was always, the plan was always to have four on standby. Yep. The next question I want to ask you is what, if any, so I'm going to phrase this the way Elaine phrases questions. What does it mean, if anything, that there wasn't a verdict reached within the couple of hours that they had remaining on Friday. Does it for you mean anything? Does it mean they're leaning one side more than the other? Does it reveal anything at all that there wasn't a verdict reached quickly? No. And I love the use of the word anything 9 million times because it, it does harken back to Elaine. Um, no, it doesn't really mean anything uh, that they didn't reach a verdict by the end of the day. Honestly, that first day, what they do is they kind of sit down in a group and they nominate a four person. That four person is basically in charge of the jury. They speak for the jury. So when something is signed and sent back to the judge, may, may it be a question or a clarification, the four person is the one that signs it. That four person is also in charge of polling the jury and taking different votes. Uh, they are the ringleader, uh, the, so to speak. So that first day, a lot of it is administrative work that they're doing. So it does it because there's a lot of comments I'm getting like, oh, it must mean this. It must mean that. So what you're saying is it means nothing. It means nothing. I think this is going to be a one to three day deliberation, to be honest. If you have found by clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Waldman, while acting as an agent for Mr. Depp, made the statements with knowledge that they were false or so recklessly as to amount to a willful disregard for the truth, that is, with a high degree of awareness that the statements were probably false, then you may award punitive damages to punish Mr. Depp for his such actions and to serve as an example to prevent others from making such statements in the future. Closing arguments. Did that work? There you go. There you go. I think so. Good. No, you had it for a second. Good morning. Thank you. So what I want people to understand here is that what the judge is doing prior to allowing the attorneys to go into closing arguments is the judge has to read jury instructions. The instructions are the law that the jury has to follow when they are deliberating and determining who is the victor or who is winning in this case. Those instructions are usually 30 minutes to an hour and a half in times, and they're very boring. The judge just reads from a script. 
Um, in this particular case, I, th I found it really interesting because the judge at some point in time says, um, you guys don't need to take notes of this. Uh, you're going to be able to just see these back in the, in the deliberation room. So I want you to pay attention to me. And all the jurors, uh, they just put their notepads down. They've been very good about taking notes, but they put the notepads down at this moment and diverted all their attention, shoulders, body, everything to the judge. And that was cool to me because it really indicated that the jury themselves had all kind of over the course of these past six weeks developed a tremendous respect for the judge. Um, and then as this is going on, uh, you see Camille getting ready for her, her closing argument. And then as she gets up to go and do that, she fumbles with the microphone. Tech, lawyers and tech is always a problem. We can never really mesh very well. Um, and it honestly creates a little comedy in the courtroom that is otherwise very tense. So Camille is struggling with her microphone. Um, and what I saw here was I was looking at the jury and the jury was warming to this. It, it personized her, it, it humanized her. And um, as she's struggling with the microphone, in particular, juror number eight, who's the middle-aged female in the front row, is looking up at Camille. She's leaned forward. She's looking up. And there's this smile that she kind of has on her face, like, it's okay. You can do this. Um, and she gets her micro microphone situated. And, and honestly, that was kind of the first body expressions that we got to see, except for a few that I kind of caught during the judge's instructions. But I think Spidey might be better suited to handle that one. So do you want to talk about that? You mean from Camille? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, thanks. I can really quickly cover sort of her body language there that we saw at the end. So we see she's sitting there on the table. She's got the pen between her hands and she's sort of rolling it back and forth like this. And she looks pensive. She's looking at the jury. I, I feel like she's about to get up. She's about to talk. And she's sort of gauging the jury, seeing what mood they're in. I think she's doing pretty much what you just did. She's trying to gauge, you know, who's paying attention, who's connected, who do I have? And, you know, the, the pen movement is interesting because it's somewhere between self-soothing and fidgeting. Usually we say in body language that repetitive gestures are self-soothing. So whenever you see someone doing something repetitive, especially a massage type gesture, whether it's something like this, whether it's wringing the hands, rubbing the shoulders, rubbing the legs, this is typically self-soothing. This isn't highly self-soothing. It's just a pen that's going back and forth like this. To me, this looks a lot like a baseball player before they go out to bat. They've got the bat there on the side. They're kind of twirling it. They're visualizing their play. I think that's what she's doing. I think she's last minute sort of rehearsing what she's about to say, and the hands are just keeping busy with that pen. Does that make sense? Yeah, I 100%. I love it. Getting ready to play. Exactly. Getting ready to play. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna dive even deeper and Rob's gonna give us some amazing insight on what the jury was doing in key moments. But before we do, do me a big favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. She claims she hasn't given the money because she was sued, but you've heard on contested evidence that she had the money for 13 months prior to this lawsuit being commenced by Mr. Depp. She had all the money and had month after month after month to, to fulfill her pledge and actually donate the money, but she didn't. She also told you that she never fulfilled the pledge because Mr. Depp sued her for defamation. That's a blatant lie. Lies. That is Ms. Hurd's narrative. Lies upon lies. Now, what I saw here with Camille was really interesting. So Camille, uh, first thing you notice is that she's got her two hands on the podium. She's anchoring herself. She's building up to this. Now, at this point in time in the closing argument, every attorney has different styles. Camille has chosen that she wants to be careful with her words. So she has written out what she wants to say. So she's reading off of the script. What I found interesting here was a lot of the stammering. Um, and it's not stammering because she's having trouble with it. It's stammering in, in my opinion. It's just an opinion. But these are words that she wrote. And as she's reading them, they're very emotional and impactful words. And she starts going into it and she'll make a statement, uh, you know, he was, and then she'll read the word, but it doesn't have the right feeling as she's reading it. So she kind of pauses in her head, stammers, and then remembers where she was emotionally when she wrote the words. And it comes out going 100 miles an hour. This is what I mean. And the emotion just comes through in bits and spurts. And it was, it was awesome to watch. And then also during this clip, what's cool about this is this is one of those shots that you actually get back to Amber Heard's counsel's table. 
and you see Amber who's writing vigorously and she is writing up a storm left, right, and center, different notes. And she's trying to pass them to Mr. Rottenborn, who's about to give his closing, closing argument. And did you want to take it from here? Yeah, well, I will. But, but before we jump into that, why don't you tell us a little bit what's happening with the jury? Cause you have some really interesting notes here about juror number eight, who unfortunately didn't make the cut. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and thank you for reminding me of that one. So juror number eight, she's our, our middle-aged uh, Caucasian female who's sitting in the middle front row. So I mentioned earlier that when Camille was getting up to give her clothes, she, she exuded this warmth to Camille. Um, and throughout the trial, she's been kind of, uh, you want to call her a butterfly. Uh, she comes out of her cocoon a little more and more and more and more as the trial goes on. And this isn't uncommon. Uh, jurors, when they start to relax and feel more comfortable in the courtroom, they start to express themselves more. Um, and juror number eight really kind of embodies that. So what's frustrating here is that I had her pegged to be the foreperson of the jury because she was so invested as the closing arguments were concluding. And when Judge Ascarati at the very end of the trial, I mean, not to, not to be a spoiler alert here, but she says that jurors three and 14 are dismissed. Um, that's not to confuse anyone in here. Jurors are given random numbers. And the way that I have it on the chart is one through nine, but we don't know their numbers. So we're trying to guess which ones three and 14 are. Well, juror number eight on the chart, H slash eight, uh, she gives this really big look of exasperation. Like, oh, she, you could tell that she wanted to be in that room. She wanted to kind of control the dialogue around this trial and, and she was disappointed to not be there. We later confirmed that, that, that she was in fact excluded. So eight and so H eight and B two are the two that were excluded three and 14 yep. were B two and H eight. Those are the two that are gone. That's correct. Those two are gone. Okay. So we have a good sense of H eight, but for those who didn't see our last video, tell us a bit about B two. What, what, what are we, what are we missing out here? What are we losing? What was he going to bring to the table had he been in that deliberation? So juror number two, he's been a lot easier to kind of gauge throughout the trial. He's much more expressive. He doesn't really hide a lot of his body language. This jury has been remarkably stoic from the very beginning. And juror number two, uh, my, my best way of saying it is my good friend, Runkle, Ian Runkle, Runkle of the Bailey. Um, when we were in the courtroom together, he kind of called him, uh, he's my boredom canary. So... He's the canary in the coal mine. When the jury is starting to get bored, number two is going to tell you when it's starting to happen. Uh, he's very, he, he's not good at hiding what he's thinking. Um, he didn't really show a lot of love for Elaine Redahoff and honestly showed a lot of skepticism anytime anyone talked about the abuse allegations. So when he was stricken, uh, Runkle and I had two competing lists of uh, worst case scenarios for Johnny Depp. And on Runkle's list, his worst case scenario included juror number eight, who was stricken. My worst case list included juror number two, who was stricken. So both of us kind of viewed two and eight as being pro Johnny Depp. So when he was gone, that kind of changed the dynamic for the jury. I quickly want to touch on what you were saying about Camille, because I couldn't agree with you more. I think that was brilliant. And I feel like as she wrote this, exactly like you said, she was feeling certain emotions. And now... It's almost like when she says something and she doesn't get that emotion right, she's almost even disappointed in herself because we kind of even see that deep exhale. But you've heard on contested evidence. That she As she's like, come on, you can do this the way you wanted to do it. So I definitely agree with you that there's some sort of plan in place and she wants to deliver it a certain way. Absolutely. Yeah, she's building the emotion. And they were designed to shock you and overwhelm you which you have. We told you that this would be a performance, the role of her lifetime, as a heroic survivor, survivor of brutal abuse. When Mr. Depp brought this case for defamation, Ms. Heard went all in. So this is our first suggestion as to how juror number five might be leaning. Juror number five, as you might recall, top right, is the, middle, the mid thirties Asian female. And during this bit of uh, closing argument by Ms. Vasquez, you see Johnny Depp's body language. And I don't like a lot of this. Um, I haven't been very critical of Johnny Depp or his team and how they've been sitting at the table until this point. But when Johnny Depp is sitting there, you see Ms. Vasquez talking about something very serious that she's addressing in this argument. And instead of Johnny Depp being engaged, 
um, as I would like him to be, which is kind of uh, elbows or forearms on the table, down, focused, being serious and attentive. He's leaning back. And then he reaches for his coffee cup, takes a sip. And at this moment, you see Juror 5 glance from Camille Vasquez to Johnny Depp. Now, what's interesting about that is that Camille, that uh, Juror number 5 at this point is leaning backwards and to the left. Not so much aggressively away, but is, is almost lazy and has been looking this way the whole time. And now Camille Vasquez is, is delivering this argument. Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp takes a sip of the coffee, and then you see the juror do this. Glance at Johnny Depp. And this is kind of the first indication that you get from juror number five that there might be something of a judgment in her eyes or body language. The interesting thing about the juror number five is that she's wearing a mask. And it would be really important for me in that moment to see what her face and nose is doing because there's a lot of research on the emotions that all humans experience the same way, universal emotions. And contempt and disgust both have a lot of activity around the nose. We start crinkling like this. And contempt is the only one that is not symmetric. So anger, disgust, sadness, joy are all symmetric. But contempt is the only one where one side of the nose goes up. And this is usually moral superiority. So if this person's leaning back and they kind of dart at Johnny and we see that look, I would like to know if there's something going on around that, uh, that nose. But without it, you feel like this was sort of like a bit of a contemptuous look? I mean, I, I can't really tell you because that's the thing. This is one of these only trials where we get where the jurors are wearing masks and um, it makes reading them very difficult because the mask do doesn't just cover the nose, it covers the cheekbones. So you can't get any look at the, the face and how it's moving, whether one side's going up, you smile, smirk, anything. It's really difficult. All you have is the shoulders, the neck, the uh, eyes, and then the head tilt. That's all you really have to, to go off of. But there was some sort of shift of attention here. Yep. Important to note. Thank you. That's, that's really great insight. Ms. Hurd has told you that she has mountains of evidence of abuse. But there are no medical records reflecting she sustained any injuries from the abuse she claims. Ms. Hurd had medical professionals at her disposal. Dr. Kipper, Debbie Lloyd, her own nurse, Erin Filotti. And yet, there is nothing. Ms. Hurd wants you to believe that she gave Mr. Depp a big knife that said, hasta la muerte, until death. All right, Rob, so I must admit you have me really curious about this one because I don't really know why this is on your list. I'm just seeing Camille Vasquez do what Camille Vasquez does best, poking holes at the narrative. Uh, I personally really love to hear her say, hasta la muerte, you know, like in her native tongue. I thought that was really cool, but besides that, I'm guessing, hoping you saw something happen in that courtroom that we're not seeing here because I'm not quite sure why this was on your list. So go ahead. Yep. Okay. So here we have two clips that are back to back. Now, both of these take place within about a minute of each other. And for the import of the audience watching this right now, you have to kind of envision where I'm sitting in the gallery. I'm in the gallery about three rows back, four rows back on the right hand side, and I'm looking dead across. Camille Vasquez at the jury. Well, directly in my line of sight, one row ahead of me is Whitney Hurd, Amber's sister. So during that first clip that we saw, the mountains of evidence, uh, as, as uh, Camille Vasquez is saying, mountains of evidence, um, I cannot help but see Whitney Hurd kind of react to that one. And with that one, she hears the mountains of evidence and you see a cheek raise. You see a cheek raise, a visible I'm going to call it a smirk, a visible smirk, enough that I it caught my attention. And then instantly you see her look down and then you see her look up. And now I thought this was important because in my notes, I actually wrote the word reset because um, it looked like when she had the cheek raise, came down, she came up and was back to normal. I don't I mean, Spidey, I, I said the word reset, but is that something you, that you see often? Yeah. So that's really interesting. And I love the fact that you're using the word reset. So. From what you're describing, what seems to be happening here is very often in serious situations, you know, like think about like a wedding when we're all supposed to be serious or like a serious presentation in class. Every now and then something happens that makes someone react and our first reflex is typically to look down and recollect our thoughts. And it's usually something in our head that's going like, okay, this isn't the time for that. Come on, you can do this. 
and we kind of just sort of wipe that away and come back. So the fact that you're calling it a reset is actually a really great term. And I feel like maybe that's what we saw here. Typically this happens with a lip compression or tightness of the lips where something happens and we go, we laugh or we smile and we go, okay, so we look down, we collect ourselves and come back. So it's very possible that when Whitney heard mountains of evidence, a part of her may have been like, is it really mountains? I'm not sure that's the word I would use. So she kind of started and she goes, oh my God, wait, hold on. That's not a time to smile. Let's recollect our thoughts and come back. Do you feel like that describes what you may have seen? Yeah, that's absolutely possible. Yeah. And that brings us to the second clip, the knife. Now, this one was a little bit curious because it might be nothing. It might be something. But when you hear her bring the knife up, let me, let me give a layout of the courtroom here. So there's the jury box that's up front. And then when something flashes on screen to the jury, the box is comprised of seats across, seats across. And there's monitors between each seat. So the jurors are looking down at the monitors. But for the gallery, as we are seeing something thrown up on screen, the monitors are elevated up in the sky. Right up here. Boom and boom. Well, Whitney heard when the knife gets thrown up on the monitor, has to look up and to the knife. And then as she comes down from that, she looks down, sweeps her eyes over, and then makes a brief pause at her sister before she comes back to dead center. I don't mean, I don't know if it means anything one way or the other, but it was something that caught my eye. Um, and it was a noticeable pause. So I'm not going to speculate. I will say that it was noticeable and it was kind of funny that brought up at the knife. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. So yeah, again, I totally agree with you. For me, what you observed is so much more important. I could throw in a couple little tips here and there, but this is something that's just this one isolated behavior and I wasn't there, so I don't know. It could have been something she saw in her sister she just wanted to check with. It could have been something that caught her eye that has nothing to do with her sister. It could be a billion different things. There isn't much there without a cluster, without context. There isn't much for me to analyze there. Ms. Heard testified that after an incident in December 2015, she had two black eyes, a broken nose, and chunks of hair missing. The assault was allegedly so violent that there was blood left all over the pillows, and Mr. Depp had broken the bed frame. Pictures were taken of that bed frame. And in that picture, there appears to be a pocket knife on the bed. And that picture fails to capture the bloody pillows. And here is what Ms. Heard looked like on the James Corden show the next day. All right, well, I personally love that clip because we're talking about the bed frame and the damage to the bed frame. And there's this brilliant lawyer on YouTube. I don't know if you guys have watched. He broke down because he has a ton of experience in carpentry and woodworking. And he breaks down the likelihood of the damage on that bed. And wait a minute, he's on this stream. It's Rob from Law & Lumber. So Rob, you did a brilliant video. If you haven't seen it, everyone, go watch that video where you used your experience, not only legally, but also as a, someone who has tons of experience working with wood, where you explained that for that damage to happen, it would have to be done a certain way because of the integrity and the structure of wood. And it, it would require a knife. And all of a sudden, shortly after that video, all of a sudden in the courtroom, it seems like this all came up. The damage, the knife on the bed. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything because I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to get an objection for speculation, but it's interesting how shortly after your video, all this bed stuff came up in that courtroom. But anyways, they start by talking about that. Camille's poking holes. Um, and then the Corden thing comes up. And I think you have some interesting notes for the jury here. I just want to throw this in. We see Amber writing this note for uh, her lawyer, for Elaine. And it's almost like she puts it there and Elaine looks at it stone-faced. Really no reaction there. She's just looking at this. And she kind of like, we almost see this little gesture towards Amber, like what, what is this? And she just sort of turns right back and listens to Miss Vasquez or Camille once again. And uh, it's just so bizarre how there's no, there, you know, typically you would see her acknowledge it or go, okay, like there's nothing there. She's like, yeah, I don't, that's not, I don't know what that is almost, but, but Rob, take it away. Yeah. All right. So one, um, 
I actually didn't realize that when I, I highlighted that clip, I focused on Amber first, didn't realize the bed was there. And then I was focusing on actually the bigger part of that, which was the James Corden photos. Um, but thanks for the shout out. So the James Corden photos, the reason why I focused on that one, um, of our jurors, juror number three, top middle, he has been at the most stoic juror I could ever freaking imagine seeing. I mean, he is an Easter Island stone head. He does not move. It also doesn't help that he's wearing mask, glasses, and has hair that comes up and actually covers his eyebrows. So you can't see anything. And he's also really good at sitting still. Spidey, you might get a kick out of this one. His his baseline is this whole, he crosses his hands and leaves him here on his, on his chair as he swivels back and forth. It gives you nothing. That's all he has. The shoulders aren't moving. Nothing's there. It's impossible. Well, the reason why this was important to me is this was the first time that juror number three moved. And he did a full lean in to the screens. Remember the last clip I told you the screens were in front of the jurors, a little off center. And when the James Corden photos came up, it's the first time. And I actually wrote in my notes, I said, juror number three moves and circled it like 9 million times because he actually did the full lean forward and stared at these pictures with juror number three. It's impossible because he doesn't give you anything, but this was significant to me because it was the first time he actually did something. That's fascinating. So we're not seeing much on his face. Cause like you said, a lot of it is covered, but we're definitely seeing some sort of for the first time interest here as he's leaning in. And there's something about these photographs that is interesting to him. Oh, yeah. Think about the message that Mr. Death and his attorneys are sending to Amber and by extension to every victim of domestic abuse everywhere. If you didn't take pictures, it didn't happen. If you did take pictures, they're fake. If you didn't tell your friends, you're lying. And if you did tell your friends, they're part of the hoax. If you didn't seek medical treatment, you weren't injured. If you did seek medical treatment, you're crazy. So this is our first look at Benjamin Rottenborn's closing argument. Now, right off the bat, you can see a very different approach than Camille Vasquez. He positions himself about two feet off of the podium. And he begins this little rhythmic and methodic look to him. Now, there's a lot of things about this that I love from a litigator standpoint. One, uh, look at the position of his hands. He doesn't, you know what? He he kind of crooks them here. Now we're taught this uh, as litigators that you kind of want to, when you're addressing the jury, you want to be like a shortstop in baseball where you're uh, waiting for a ground ball to be hit towards you, where your hands are open and receiving to the ground ball as it's coming to you. Um, there's something about that gesture when you have it low on the body that's very welcoming and engaging to a jury. And then the next thing that I notice about his, his uh, demeanor here is the cadence. So the rocking and swaying, some people were making comments to me that this made it look like he was on a boat. And I didn't see it that way. The way I saw it was that he was setting a rhythm. And you can see it with his hands. As he's starting to say words, the hands are becoming methodical. And you can kind of see it uh, if you were to think about someone learning piano lessons. You set a metronome. That's what he's doing here. He's creating a cadence for his voice and he's actually resonating this out in a very uniform tone where every word has an impact. And I love this as a strategy for closing argument. I don't know, Spidey, did you catch anything on this one? Honestly, man, what you just said was perfect. So to give a little bit more of the technical terms on this, illustrators is what we call gestures that we make when we speak and they emphasize points. Now, when we're being honest or truthful, illustrators are synced with what we say because they originate from the same thought. So we have a thought and that thought gets translated verbally as we communicate it, but that same thought makes us move. So everything is synced. When we're being dishonest or not genuine, often the illustrators are out of sync with what we're saying. Because what happens is we say something, but we're not really feeling that. It's not coming from that same emotion. So we say it, then in our heads we go, Oh no, do a gesture to really drive it home. So we might say something like, that really pisses me off. And then we hit because it's two separate thoughts. We're telling ourselves really try to sell this narrative. 
Whereas when it's authentic, we go, now that really pisses me off. It's synced. And what's crazy about this is even people who don't know this, who haven't studied this, can intuitively feel when illustrators are out of sync because it just seems not genuine. So you're absolutely right here. His illustrators are on point. As he speaks, he uses gestures to drive those points home. The other note to make about this, well, two things. One, steepling is this. This is what we call steepling, when the fingers come together. It's a very confident pose. It's typically right around the waist area. When it's too high, it looks like we're trying too hard to sell this confidence or to feel confident. And it also blocks the person you know, from seeing our face. So usually it's down here when it's confident. Now, sometimes steepling collapses like this. That's not a big deal. We start to see lack of confidence when we see this gesture, pacifying. Massaging gestures are self-soothing. We also see lack of confidence when the thumbs disappear. So our thumbs are very important to us. The way we evolved, we know subconsciously to protect our thumbs. Because if we didn't have our thumbs, we can't hold tools, we can't hold weapons. Our survival really depends on the use of our thumbs. So very often, when our confidence drops, those thumbs disappear. Whether it's behind the hand, whether it's in the elbows, the pockets behind the back, we protect our thumbs subconsciously. So here, we're not seeing a big lack of confidence. Yes, his hands are together, but those thumbs are exposed out here. It's pretty confident. There isn't this massaging gesture. Finally, let's talk about the sway. We're seeing this from the side. He's not playing to us. He's playing to the jury. From the side, it seems like he's swaying. Because if I was sideways like this, I'd be swaying. But to them, it doesn't look like sway. It looks like he's coming in and out. And we do this all the time to command attention. Even in the way we talk to the camera, Rob, we'll often lean in and say something important and then lean back. And it creates this rapport where we're going back and forth together. And I come in and I move back and I pull you into that energy. So I think his body language here is confident, it's calm. And although to us, it looks like he's swaying, to that jury, it does not. And the swaying thing, I didn't pick up on that at all. Uh, the leaning in, leaning out. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. Okay. I see it. You know awesome. what? Because it's different for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Engaging them. That's cool. Yeah. Now, we'll talk about Miss Herb's claim of defamation against Mr. Depp, and Elaine will address most of that in a few minutes. But your key question to answer is Does the First Amendment give Miss Herb the right? to write the words that she wrote in this article on December 18th, 2018. That's the question. And you cannot simultaneously protect and uphold the First Amendment and find in favor of Johnny Depp on his claim. You simply cannot. Rob, I'm really excited for your thoughts on this one. I just want to throw in one quick thing, and this has nothing to do with my experience in body language or behavior analysis. It has nothing to do with my degree in social psychology. The reason I know this is because I have enormous experience as a performer on stage, as a mentalist and as a magician, which is where a huge part of my career was done. And I want to talk about when he says this article and he picks up that piece of paper and he goes Tch -tch, like this. So we know in magic and mentalism, we, we, we study this, that if we really want to sell an idea to someone and we really want to put an idea in their heads or sell a narrative, we don't say something like, you shuffled the deck of cards or you shuffled that deck of cards. If we pick it up and we go, now you shuffled this deck of cards and we put it on display and we say this, remind them it's here, it's tangible, it's real. It makes the whole narrative so much more tangible. So the fact, to me, it's, it, it looked like a really great piece of performance there where instead of saying the article or that article or whatever, he picks it up and he goes, this article. And they can't, from where they are, they can't really see the details of that article, but because he's holding it up and he's showing it, he's going tap, tap, almost the way we present things on stage, it just makes the whole thing more tangible and more real. I don't know if you agree, I don't know what you thought of that, but to me that moment just seemed so like the way we're trained to talk about and give importance to props as mentalists and magicians. Well, I don't know if you've ever given this thought, and I think it's a pretty good segue. Um... As a mentalist magician, you play on a stage, right? All right. So uh, think of the courtroom as a massive theater. That's what it is. Uh, it's a real life drama that's playing out. Yes, the facts are serious and the consequences are there. 
but in reality, it is a real life drama that's being played out for the audience, the audience being the gallery and the jury and the judge. And this theater has a lot of moving parts. So you have the attorneys, you have the judge, you have the witnesses. And if you divide the play into three parts, um, the beginning, the opening statements, then you have the middle of the play, the bulk of the play, you have the witnesses testifying. And then you have the end, the climactic event, and where everything comes to a crescendo and all everything is revealed. That's the closing statements. So if this is a theater where all of this is playing out, everyone plays their roles. And I want you to take that visual and then move it to closing statements, closing arguments. Closing argument is the only time when the attorney is allowed to go in front of their bench and then play to the jury. The jury is the audience in this moment. It's the only time when you see the podium actually move right in front of that jury box. And that space between the jury box, the judge's bench, and counsel's table, that's called the well. And this is what's so cool about this clip is Benjamin Rottenborn in this moment becomes the stage actor of a freaking century because what he does here is really pretty amazing. You see a lot of the body language just invite the jury into him. He is walking back and forth. Now he's doing this not because he's pacing or nervous, but because a moving target requires the eyes to track the moving target. And when you're moving, you're preventing the jury from looking away from you because they feel like if they look away from you, they're going to miss something you say. Also look at his hands. His hands always remain below uh, below his chest level, below his arms. And even when he raises something to point somewhere, it never goes above shoulder because you don't want the jury to be distracted from your face. If I put my hands up here and I go wild with it, you're looking here, here, or in this hand. You don't want that. You want the jury focused in on your, your face. You want them listening to what you're saying. And he always maintains this casual steeple and walking backwards and forwards and then going back to your point, Spidey, of the leaning in and out, as you're doing this, you're engaging the audience. It really is. I mean, it's theater 101. You develop the cadence at the beginning. You have a rhythm and then you start to move. And now all of a sudden you have a captivated audience. And what's cool about this one is the jury really responds to this. They're really leaning in. They're engaging. They actually see him doing this. Anyways, I, I thought that this beginning to a closing argument was beautifully orchestrated regardless of what the facts are it was beautifully done it's incredible because i had no idea like i we didn't talk about this at all we did not when we separately looked at this clip we did not discuss that we picked up here that this was a performance piece at all i didn't even know that you were going to talk about this whole you know play performance theater thing so i think it's really cool how we both sort of saw this as almost an actor in a play that said hopefully that corpse is in the fucking trunk of a Honda Civic. That's how he bookended their relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, these words are a window into the heart and mind of America's favorite pirate. This is the real Johnny Depp. Like, are you kidding me? That's, that's, that's the window into the mind of America's favorite pirate. It's so good. And you know what I love about this clip? You know what I love about this clip? Is that like Camille and Johnny are impressed by the line and they're not even trying to hide it. I like, know. If, I know. Like, they're not like, like jo Johnny's like, Johnny's like looking at like, he go, at first yeah. he's like, did you just say that? And he like, he takes yeah. a second and he goes, that's good. And Camille even yeah. goes, looks at Johnny and goes, that was good. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost like he's proud of that. There's a part of him that's like proud of that line. He's like, yeah, that, that's me. I like that. I'm not, I'm, not even, yeah. I'm not even upset at this. No, I see it. That was awesome. <laughs> and you know, like also, let's take a second here. Let, let's be serious here for a sec. Linguistically, it's so powerful because yeah. the first thing he's doing is he's reminding everyone that the reason we know and love Johnny Depp is that he's an actor. So it's kind of dropping in their heads that, you know, this could all just be an act. The second reason is really powerful is he's acknowledging how much of a great actor he is. So he's separating the fact that he likes him as an actor from what he did or what he allegedly did. We have to separate that. I could separate my feelings from what he allegedly did. And I could separate the actor from the person. Yep.
it, it, it personifies Johnny Depp to Benjamin Rottenborn, but also gives him distance to attack the behaviors that Johnny Depp engaged in. Rob, I wanna ask you another question about this because I, I have very torn feelings and I know that you know much more about this than I do. So when you read those texts, he didn't hold back at all with the vulgarities. He said some pretty disgusting things. And in my head, I'm going, I can see the pros and cons of that. The pros is if he really emphasizes those horrifying things, it reminds them that like Johnny said these terrible things. But there's another part of me that's going, wait, but when he says that, it, it's also him saying it, the lawyer, Rottenborn. So is he not associating that language to himself? So what are your feelings here? Is this something you would lean into the way he did and really pronounce and commit to those disgusting words or distance and sort of subtly sort of muffle them a little bit? Well, so let me give you probably the most like lawyerly answer I can give you. It, it depends. And it depends on various things. So let me take a step back. The way that I would approach this is if I was Benjamin Rottenborn and if I was delivering this closing argument, um, I'm reading the jury as I'm doing it. And if I have the jury locked in, if the jury is following me and I'm painting this picture for them and I can see that in their mind, they are there with me watching Johnny Depp do things. When I say those words out loud, they're not hearing me say them. They're envisioning Johnny Depp say them. However, if I'm a bad storyteller and if I'm just reading off a script and if I'm doing blah, 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 blah. And the second I get to those words, when the jury hears the words, the profanities, the F bombs, the C and X Tuesday, all the above, they're not hearing Johnny Depp. They're just hearing me say these things out loud. So it goes to a judgment call on Rottenborn's uh, part here. And what I thought was really impressive here is that Rottenborn, I mean, now we're like 70% into his closing argument, maybe 80%. He has the jury wrapped. He's been doing this back and forth, the theater. He has them engaged. That now has opened up the ability for him to go in and say these things and portray them in the form of Johnny Depp. It was, it was actually pretty, it was pretty good and pretty, Pretty well done. I just had an epiphany. Dude, I just had an epiphany. Do share. It's incredible. Share. It's not Johnny Depp. It's not Johnny Depp. It's Jack Sparrow. <gasps> because, do you know what I'm saying? So he reads these vulgarities, these disgusting things, and then he doesn't talk about Johnny Depp. He talks about Jack Sparrow, America's he favorite gives, pirate. He gives the jury an enemy they can convict that's not Johnny Depp. Dude, it taints, he, it taints the beloved pirate. It's like, you thought he was this jolly pirate who goes on adventures. No, no, no. He's a monster who uses these words. So he's not crumbling Johnny Depp. He's crumbling that untouchable Jack Sparrow. What Ben Rottenborn did in that moment, based on your analysis, is Ben Rottenborn created a villain that the jury can find did something that is not the person sitting in front of them. Dude. The, Ben Rottenborn yes. literally just created, he just created in the mind of the jury, he created uh, Johnny Depp Sparrow that the jury can now say did these things and not feel bad because they didn't necessarily say Johnny Depp did them. They said the mean pirate did them. It's the monster argument. It's the monster argument personified and dramatized and made flesh and bone by the words of Benjamin Rottenborn. Dude, it, that pirate line is so layered. Like you just keep realizing how well-timed it was because it and comes how, right out. Like oh. it, it disillusions them about the favorite pirate. It creates a villain. It disconnects Johnny Depp from his behaviors. It does so, it's so well-placed. Everything about that, everything about that is insanely good trial strategy from a mental, emotional, psychological standpoint, all of it. That one line, that one line, and there's a reason I walked out of that freaking courtroom remembering that line without writing it in my notepad. There's a reason I walked out and remembered it verbatim to today. Today, I didn't have to look at my notepad once to remember exactly what Ben Rottenborn said. And when he said it again and you played that video, I remembered where it was. I remember how he said it. I remember what was said before and what was said after. That is in the jury's mind.
that is that was masterful. I think you made the perfect parallel earlier when you compared this to if the glove does not fit, you must acquit, which put Johnny Cochran and you know the whole OJ trial like that line is the line people remember from that defense team. And uh, I think this is the one. I think this is the one from this trial. Yeah. And, and, and to be clear to the audience, this doesn't mean that either one of them wins. What this no. means is that this is something that was put into the jury. And it was a very masterful move on the part of one of these legal teams that, that created a narrative for the trial. Um, yeah. So I think it was masterfully done. Rob, I think that's a great point and a good time for me to remind the viewers that we're not taking sides here. We're not defending anyone. We're not attacking anyone. We're just using our experience to point out behaviors and patterns and what we're seeing. Rob, you were in the room. You have extensive experience with law and you're just talking us through the technique and the behaviors and that's it. We're not taking sides, just pointing out behaviors. This is just me giving an assessment of what I'm seeing in the room. While we're throwing disclaimers, this one's also really important for me personally. I know that in the video, quite often, I say Elaine and Camille, but then I say Mr. Rottenborn, and I really don't want that to be misinterpreted, that I'm using his last name, but for them, I'm using their first names. It's because the first name gets confusing with Rottenborn. His first name is Ben, which is also the name of Johnny's lawyer, Ben Chu. So I think early on, in the trial, we started referring to them as Rottenborn and Chu, and then Camille and Elaine, also because Elaine's last name is, is really hard to pronounce. So I just think that's the way it is. I don't mean any disrespect by it. Uh, it's just the way I got used to talking about it. Yeah, and it doesn't help that uh, when Elaine is giving her closing argument, she starts throwing around, and Ben just told you, and I'm sitting in the courtroom going, Mr. Chu did not say those things. And then realizing all of a sudden that she's referring to Ben Rottenborn, not Ben Chu. So yeah, it can get confusing. So we're just trying to make it clear for everybody who's watching. I want to thank you so much for your time. Once again, this was such valuable information because, you know, lawyers can look at this footage and have opinions. Behavior analysts can look at this footage and have opinions. But having someone who understands both those things at the degree that you do, both law and behavior analysis and body language, actually being in the room I don't think there's more valuable commentary to be had on this entire trial. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, Rob. And uh, I guess we're going to see this week how this whole thing uh, concludes. Thank you very much, buddy. And thank you for the very big compliment. I, I very much appreciate the work that you do. And I love watching everything you put out, buddy. Um, guys, this, this guy puts out great content and has insanely good analysis. And yeah, I guess we'll find out later this week uh, when the jury comes back with a verdict. So until then, we'll see you later excited. See you everyone. So there it was everyone. I hope you enjoyed this. As we just said, the verdict is coming very soon and this whole thing will end and we will find out what's going to happen with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. If you enjoyed this video, please remember part two or the rest of this. It's not really part one, part two, but the rest of this conversation is on Rob's channel, Law & Lumber. I will leave a link in the description. It's an awesome channel. He started it recently, but he's got such great content and such great commentary on legal matters. So please go give him a follow, check out the rest of the video, and I will see you on the next one.